All right, today is day one for AT&T and its life as a non-media company as the split with Warner Media becomes official. More on what the future holds for AT&T, we are joined by Craig Moffitt, Moffitt Nathanson, co-founder and senior analyst. Craig, always good to see you. So what, what does the future look like for AT&T? Well, it's going to be challenging. For Thank you for having me back on. Um, it, it's going to be challenging um, because of the industry that they're in, right? I mean, the, the, the telecom industry is a, is a slow growth sector. Um, and AT&T has now a, a fairly familiar set of telecom assets. It's, it's about one third wireline and two thirds wireless. The wireline part of the business is shrinking pretty significantly. And the uh, the wireless business um, isn't showing any pricing growth, but uh, but is the industry is at least showing some subscriber growth. But it's a slow growth business with very little pricing power, even in the face of seven percent inflation. Craig, so if there are these concerns for the industry that AT and T is now operating in primarily, why do you think the stock is moving higher? Currently up about five and a half percent this morning. Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of things happening. Um, First, I think the fact that both AT&T and um, Warner Discovery are up nicely this morning just tells you how incompatible these two businesses were, right? It's, um, you're seeing investors uh, that struggled to, to want to own both of them, but there are investors for, for either of them separately. So that's part of what's going on. I think there's also a bit of, of, um, a, of a rally in AT&T shares because of comments that um, the CEO, John Stanky, made in the Wall Street Journal um, over the weekend, suggesting that there's some room for additional pricing. You know, that's that's really been the core issue for the wireless industry is is that it's it has been a, an industry with essentially no pricing power. And so anyone uh, in the industry and you've seen that with with uh, Verizon and T-Mobile both being um, up slightly this morning um, in a down market because I think people are just happy to hear anybody saying that there is an appetite for higher prices. Whether there's any ability to actually follow through on that remains to be seen. Uh, is there really uh, the likelihood that AT&T could push through price increases? Craig, I, I just look at my cable and phone bills. They're already out of control. Uh, I, I understand why Stanky would say that, but could price increases really stick? Yeah, that, that I think is the problem, right? Is, is particularly on the wireless side of the business, um, the 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 it, everybody would acknowledge that there's very low price elasticity. You'd give your left arm rather than give up your cell phone. The problem is um, that that you have three relatively undifferentiated carriers in AT and T, Verizon, and T Mobile. That for most people, um, the the are willing to switch for relatively modest differences. So it makes it very hard for any one player to push through price increases. Um, because they will lose market share in the process. Craig, what does this mean? Uh, AT and T out there solo again, just focusing on its telecom. What does this mean to the likes of a T Mobile and a Verizon? Well, it, it, it probably doesn't mean all that much. You know, it, the, the AT and T was was still and and will continue to be um, a major force in telecom. Uh, arguably, now there are fewer distractions. Um, but uh, but I think if you look forward for where this industry is going, you're in this long term transition, right, where some years ago, um, it, it was fairly well understood that that Verizon had the best network and T-Mobile was was the weakest. AT&T was somewhere in the middle. Um, now it looks like as we enter the 5G cycle um, and we're still relatively early days in what's likely to be a decade long 5G story um, that. It looks like T-Mobile will have the best network in the industry, Verizon very likely second, and AT&T very likely the, the, the weakest of the, the three majors. Why that's so problematic for AT&T is that their prices are quite high. Um, and uh, it is very difficult, obviously, to compete when you have both high prices and a weaker service um, offering. And that's to some degree, why they've been so promotional. AT&T has been by far the most promotional of the three carriers in offering handset discounts. And it's precisely to, to sort of offset a, um, a, a relatively higher price point for a service that isn't perceived to be a better service. 
Uh, Craig, switching gears, as you mentioned in your note, one of the AT&T-specific concerns has stemmed from its previous acquisitions of Time Warner and DirecTV and what that's done to its balance sheet. How do you think AT&T undoes some of the damage, as you called it, from these high-priced deals? Yeah, look, it's a huge issue. Um, their, their reported leverage, that is their, the amount of debt that they have, um, is high, but not as high as, as the reality because um, th they also are very, very large users, as are all wireless operators, of operating leases for all those towers that they have to rent for their, their cellular equipment. Um, those operating leases get counted as debt by the debt rating agencies and uh, by Moffitt Nathanson and should be counted as debt by investors. They're off balance sheet. But including those, AT&T is levered at more than four times EBITDA, which is very high for a business that, that has essentially no, no growth. Um, and so that, the problem is they will have to delever. Um, that's why they cut their, their dividend um, as part of this transaction was because they have to generate uh, or they have to have enough cash left over to be able to pay down debt. And, and they're, they're balancing on a knife edge because their dividend now is about $8 billion. They're targeting about $20 billion in the way they count EBITDA, but uh, sorry, uh, they count free cash flow, but in reality, their free cash flow is more like about 14 or 15. So they'll be able to pay down debt by $6, 7000000000 billion a year. Um, that may not be fast enough. And if there's any weakening at all in their, their EBITDA growth, um, or their EBITDA, as, as I said, it's not really growing at all. But if it starts to, to decline a little bit, um, then the free cash flow falls, and it's not at all clear that they will be able to, um, to delever that balance sheet. So it's still very much an issue for a company that, you know, remember, they paid $67 billion for DirecTV, and then four years later sold it for what was the equivalent of about $18 billion. Um, they didn't actually sell it, but it was about an $18 billion valuation. Um, they didn't do quite as badly with with uh, Warner Media, but it still left a lot of debt uh, on the balance sheet, and um, and so they are still hamstrung by the moves that they made to diversify away from telecom starting in 2014. Well, let's lock in on one of the people, uh, Craig, that has been responsible for putting AT and T's balance sheet in tatters. Uh, it is CEO John Stanky. How much confidence do you think this board has in Stanky that that he's the right person to be leading AT and T for the next three years? Well, first, I would say um, that John Stanky de deserves a lot of credit for reversing path um, fairly quickly. It is it is quite unusual for a CEO to uh, who was part of a diversification strategy to change path and and redirect so quickly. Um, so, uh, uh, as I said, I, I actually um, give John quite a bit of credit for for changing course. Um, I think the challenge facing at and t is is really not so much um, uh, a function of any one person. it's it's the challenge of the industry that they're in. Um, and uh, and uh, you know the, the, again, the pricing challenges that that uh, exist in the wireless industry and have for a long time um, really sort of define the the path forward for the company. It's very hard for a company that is as hard that is as as capital intensive as a telecom operator um, for, for this kind of the, the cult of, of, of personality type of CEO to make all that much difference. So I, I tend to think of this as much more of a structural issue than it is um, an issue about any one individual.